Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you might be. It is my great pleasure to welcome a former PhD student of IMPAN, uh, a member of our non commutative geometry research group, Jacek Rajczok, who is now Scottish, and uh, he will uh, tell us everything and more very generously about approximation properties for locally compact quantum groups. Jacek, the Zoom is yours, take it away. Thank you very much and thank you for the introduction. Uh, what I'll be speaking about today is, well, uh, mainly mostly about uh, one particular approximation property of quantum groups, namely the, the approxim approximation property, uh, which is the analog of the AP introduced in the context of classical locally compact groups by Hagrup group and Krauss. And this is a joint work uh, with Matt Doss and Christian Voigt. Uh, okay. I would like to start very slowly uh, with introducing this property in the context of classical context of locally compact groups. Um, okay, so let me start with introducing some uh, basic notation that I hope uh, most of us uh, know here. So let's G be a locally compact group and let's fix a left hard measure mu. Then, uh, we can consider uh, the left regular representation of G, uh, which are denoted by lambda. This is a representation of G on the Hilbert space of square integrable functions on G, uh, given by left translation. Uh, we can extend this, this map lambda to, to a homomorphism from L1 of G to the space of bounded operators on, uh, on L2. And it is a typical abuse of notation to uh, denote this and this map with the same letter. Uh, what I forgot to mention is that if you have any questions, then please interrupt me. We have plenty of time. All right, so uh, we have uh, we have family of operators, lambda of f for each square integrable function. Those are operators on Hilbert space, bounded operators on Hilbert space L2 of G. And we can generate the smallest system algebra, uh, which contains these operators. Uh, it, is it is denoted by C star R of G, and uh, one calls it the reduced group system algebra of G. So as a reminder, C star algebra is a uh, norm closed uh, star sub algebra of operators. Uh, we can generate also a von Neumann algebra uh, out of these operators, and it is denoted by L of G. It's called group von Neumann algebra. So uh, it is Typically, it is slightly larger. It is larger than the reduced group system algebra because now we take uh, not we take closure in the weaker topology, say non cooperator topology, because this topology is weaker than the norm topology. The resulting space space is larger. And uh, the notation L of G corresponds to the fact that we uh, generate those operators by left left translations. And using uh, Uh, in general, um, operators lambda of x do not belong to the sister algebra uh, being the gr reduced group sister algebra. However, using the bicommutant theorem, it is very easy to show that um, for each element of our group x, uh, the corresponding translation operator lambda of x belongs to the group of an algebra. In particular, uh, unit always belongs to the group of an algebra. However, the reduced group sister algebra uh, can be non-mental. Okay, so uh, we have those uh, those objects studied in non-commutat harmonic analysis. Uh, I want to introduce another uh, another space, <clears throat> uh, namely the Fourier algebra. Uh, by definition, in the context of locally compact groups, uh, Fourier algebra uh, A of G is the space of functions G, uh, for which you can find two square integrable functions, xi and eta, and uh, we, we have expression for uh, for our function g, namely uh, g is the matrix coefficient of left regular representation corresponding to the functional being given as we have, uh, as we see here. Um, so by definition, it is some subspace of uh, one can check that it is a subspace of bounded functions, and one can check uh, 
uh, that in fact the space is invariant under uh, point and under pointwise multiplication of functions, this algebra. It typically it is not closed in the supremum norm. However, we can equip the space uh, with uh, with new nor norm, larger norm. Uh, the precise expression is here. Let me, if we want to calculate norm of function g, we should look at infimum of um, product of norms of vectors xi and theta. Uh, and inter inters out that in the end, if we equip a of g with pointwise multiplication and this norm, we obtain a Banach algebra. Uh, furthermore, uh, the space is contained in C0g, namely every function every function in the free algebra is continuous and vanish at infinity. A very important feature for us, probably one of the most important features of the Fourier algebra is that it, its dual can be identified with the group of normal algebra. Or in other, in other words, Fourier algebra can be identified with the pre-dual of L of G. So how does it work? Well, if we take a function in the Fourier algebra, say G, then it should correspond to a functional on L of G, but even more normal functional. So in the group for normal algebra, well, it can be either considered as generated by operators of the form lambda of F or operators of the form lambda of X. And here uh, via the spelling, uh, uh, we see how uh, we can, uh, very easily, concretely express action of the functional corresponding to fu function G on group von Neumann algebra. If we act on a operator corresponding to L1 function, lambda of F, then the resulting number is the integration. It is well defined because F is L L1 function and G is easily seen to be bounded. And uh, alternatively, one can, one can check that uh, the uh, group von Neumann algebra L of G is generated by unitary operators lambda of X. And then action on these generators is also very simple. If G acts on an unitary operator lambda of X, then uh, the resulting number is simply G of X. Uh, so uh, one can uh, be slightly worried here that, uh, well, Typically, if we work with L infinity functions, then we work, in fact, with classes of functions uh, under equivalence up to measure zero sets. But this this expression, the last expression, is well defined because G, we well, we've already said it, that Fourier algebra functions are in fact continuous, or to be more precise, in the class of function there exists a unique continuous function. Hence, G of X may is well defined. Uh, even though even though we want to see a of g as a subspace of an infinity of g. Okay, so uh, we can see uh, the Fourier algebra as a pre-dual to the group of an algebra. I want to use now, uh, I want to introduce now uh, amenability of g uh, using Fourier algebra. Uh, this is not the most typical way of introducing amenability. However, by a theorem of leptin, uh, it is equivalent to the um, more standard notion. And I want to, for now, I want to take it as a definition. So say, we say that the G is amenable if and only if Fourier algebra A of G has a bounded approximate identity, so, which by definition, it is a net in the Fourier algebra GI uh, such that uh, supremum of norms of the Fourier algebra norms of these functions uh, is finite. And furthermore, uh, this net form a left and right approximate identity, meaning that if we multiply GI from left or right by any fixed function in the Fourier algebra, then uh, the resulting net converges to, to G. And by saying that converges to G, I mean converges really in the Fourier algebra norm. Okay, so using Fourier algebra and its Banach algebra structure, we can characterize amenability of a locally compact group. And what are some examples? 
Mm, well, uh, to name some examples of amenable groups, all abelian groups or compact groups are amenable. And to give a more uh, interesting example, as infinity, uh, the group formed of permutations of the countable infinite set, which uh, group which consists of those permutations of countable infinite set, which fix all but finitely many elements, uh, it is an example of a countable uh, countable amenable group. Uh, in fact, it's very interesting because it's also ICC. Uh, however, uh, amenability is a quite strong uh, strong approximation property, and lots of groups uh, which are of interest uh, are not amenable. For example. So probably the most famous examples of non-amenable groups are the free groups on two or more generators, but also SLN R, SLN Z are non-amenable or this say this uh, semi-direct product. May I have a question? Um, sure. Uh, what about what about uh, semi-direct products of SLNs with uh, higher lattices? Are they uh, also non-examples? I would think so, yes. Okay. Uh, be because so the, uh, in the semi-direct product, SLN sits uh, as a subgroup, right? Sorry? Uh, in the semi-direct product, SLN sits as a subgroup, and I'm mean, going to would pass to a subgroup. So yes, I think if you take a semi-direct product with SLN, that as a, one of the ingredients, then you obtain a non-amenable non example. I specifically mentioned this SL to Z because I will come back to it once discussing AP. What about extensions of, uh, for instance, compact groups by Abelian? Are extensions of examples also examples or not? Yes, they are. The extension of a minimal group is again amenable, as far as I know. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so semi-direct product is a specific example of an extension. Uh, I will come back to this uh, to this uh, example uh, later on uh, because okay. So we see that uh, lots of uh, lots of interesting uh, groups are not amenable, and it is hence it is natural to to wonder if we can somehow weaken this notion so that we see uh, we have higher resolution. We can say maybe well, some of these groups are better, some of these groups are worse in the context of approximation properties, <clears throat> and the most uh, well. The first, uh, probably the first weakening of amenability that would one consider is weak amenability, but I want to go even to an even weaker property, which is uh, which is called simply approximation property, and it is usually abbreviated to AP. Um, okay, uh, to do this, I need to to introduce AP. I need to dis to discuss some operator space. Uh, some basics from the operator space theory. But I don't want to introduce too much uh, too, too much results from this theory, so I will be uh, I will restrict to the very specific two cases, uh, two families of operator spaces. Uh, the first uh, the first example that I want to look at is a von Neumann algebra. By definition, this weekly closed uh, unital star sub algebra of B of H. If we have, if we, if we have such a von Neumann algebra, then uh, we have a canonically defined norms on n by n matrices with entries from M. So how does it work? Well, if we take any matrix in M n of M, which is n by n matrix with uh, operators uh, with entries which are operators in M, then in a natural way, simply by matrix and vector multiplication, 
we can see this this matrix as an operator on uh, n-fold direct sum of h. And hence, uh, this this identification, if we see this matrix as a operator on n copies of h, we obtain a norm, simply the operator norm. In this way, on mn of m, uh, we have norm. Second example I want to look at uh, is the pre-dual of m. And also here, if we take a n by n matrix with, uh, with entries in m, m lower star, namely uh, in the space of normal functionals, then one can see this matrix as a map from von Neumann algebra m to n by n matrices with complex entries. And the formula is the most obvious thing. Uh, we take operator. Uh, we take operator um, x in M and map it to the matrix, which, as entries, have numbers omega i j of x. So this gives us a map between von Neumann algebra M and uh, one x space of n by n matrices. Hence, also here, uh, via this, say, operator norm. Uh, we have canonical norms on n by n matrices with the pre-dual of m. And, uh, well, uh, it follows that m and m lower star are examples of operator spaces. So strictly speaking, operator space is a Banach space together with choice of norms on, uh, on matrices with entries from this space. There are some conditions. Uh, natural conditions that should be satisfied. And in these cases, if we define uh, norms on n by n matrices in, in the way as, as described above, indeed, um, with this definition, we obtain our operator space structure on M and M lower star. And uh, example that is of interest to us uh, is the Fourier algebra, uh, which we, we know that we can identify with the pre-dual of the group von Neumann algebra. The next thing I want to introduce uh, is the CB norm and first amplification. So say we have a bounded linear map phi between von Neumann algebra M and itself. Then in, the, in this natural way, uh, simply by entry-wise action, we can define uh, action of phi uh, on n by n matrices. And it is often denoted by phi with uh, superscript n in brackets. Then one finally defines uh, the CB norm and uh, the notion of being completely bounded for a map between m and itself uh, by the first, the CB norm phi is given by supremum of norms of phi n, and we say that phi is completely bounded in the, if the CB norm is finite. Similarly for m lower star and more general for operator spaces, this is how one defines uh, completely bounded maps and completely bounded norm. Uh, in, the, mm, in the theory of AP, of approximation property, uh, results and notions from operator space theory, all this uh, CB, CB maps, it is quite important. Hence, uh, I wanted to introduce here uh, this notion formally. Okay, so uh, we are heading towards defining weakening of amenability, which is called approximation property. First, uh, First, let's say that uh, measurable bounded function on G is a CB multiplier. If, first of all, it is a multiplier in the sense that if we take any function in the Fourier algebra, G, and multiply A by G, then we, we are still in the Fourier algebra. Hence the name, A multiplies Fourier algebra into itself. And furthermore, uh, we want the resulting map G goes to a G uh, to be completely bounded. So CB multipliers are those those bounded functions 
which multiply Fourier algebra into itself, and the resulting part is completely bounded. So with any Fourier, uh, with any CB multiplier, we have mapped between Fourier algebra and itself. And because we identify the dual to the Fourier algebra with the group von Neumann algebra, we can take the, and to, if we take the Banach space dual map to phi of A lower star, we obtain a map which we denote by phi of A, I'm sorry, theta of A, capital theta of A. This is mapped from the group von algebra to itself. And one can check it's quite easily uh, using the concrete a formula for the pairing between Fourier algebra and group of algebra, that the resulting map uh, acts on generators lambda of f or lambda of x, uh, as is given here. So I would say it is quite a natural, natural question. Uh, our group of algebra is generated by operators, say lambda of x, which functions satisfy the property that with them, we can associate a CB map, uh, which on generators acts simply by multiplication by a number. So lambda of x is mapped by a, uh, is multiplied by a number a of x, and those are uh, precisely the CB multipliers. Okay, so with any CB multiplier, we we associate a complete normal completely bounded map uh, theta of a. Uh, and uh, let us denote by denote by MCB A of G the space of Fourier uh, CB multipliers, and uh, we equip with this, the space with the CB norm uh, of the corresponding of the corresponding CB map. You can check that this turns uh, space of CB multipliers uh, into a Banach algebra. Okay. Uh, so what kind of functions sit in here? It is quite easy to see that, uh, in fact, all Fourier algebra functions are CB multipliers. Uh, and one can show that, uh, that all CB multipliers are continuous. Hence, this we have also inclusion into the space of continuous bounded functions on G. Okay, uh, the next thing uh, I want to introduce is the pre-dual space to MCB A of G. So how does it work? Well, by definition, uh, the space of CB multipliers is a subspace of an infinity of G. Hence, an L1 function gives a bounded func functional on this, on this space simply by integration. Next, we can, uh, so it follows that we can see L, uh, L1 of G, space of L1 functions, uh, as a subspace in, in the dual space to the CB multipliers. Typically, it is not closed, but we can take closure. And this space, closure of L1 in the dual space uh, to CB multipliers, is denoted by Q. A of G. And uh, in this context of locally compact groups, uh, what Hagerup and Krauss showed is that, in fact, the space uh, can be seen as a pre dual to the space of CD multipliers. So in other words, and a, and a bounded functional on Q A of G is given by, uh, corresponds to the uh, correspond to the CB multiplier. This means that QA of G, this very abstractly defined space, uh, can be seen as, uh, well, in fact, is a, a pre-dual space to, uh, to the space of CB multipliers. It is quite, so the definition is quite abstract. We take closure, but what, what kind of elements Sit in there, and, and I will come back to this uh, to this question a little bit later. For now, just let's take uh, uh, let's just take from it that there exists a space Q A of G, uh, which is a pre-dual space to the space of CB multipliers. And finally, 
here using using this uh, this residual a group and clause define approxim approximation property AP of our locally compact group G. So how does it work? Well, we simply say that uh, G has AP if there exists a net AI in the Fourier algebra which converges to the unit uh, in in the weak star uh, topology of uh, uh, in the weak star topology. And here I mean the weak star topology really corresponding to uh, to the to, to the space QA of G. And I'm sorry, here should be star. This is of course weak star topology in the dual space of the CB multipliers. So this is how uh, Hagerup and Krauss introduce AP. And I would say the way to think about it is that we have a net of nice function, AI, nice, meaning that they sit in the Fourier algebra, but they are in particular C0, but Fourier algebra functions are just more structured, they are easier to work with, and they converge to the unit, uh, but they converge in the in a very weak sense, uh, namely only in, in weak star topology. Okay, how about the examples? Sorry, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, why did you put this star? This is a good question. Um, sorry. Um, sorry, of course. A and AI and unit uh, are CB multipliers, and this is weak star topology corresponding to, to the pre-dual space. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, comment. OK, so um, examples. Uh, we've introduced amenability via Leptin theorem as an existence of a, uh, approximate, a bounded approximate unit in Fourier algebra. And uh, quite easily one, one shows that uh, uh, this net and uh, this bounded approximate unit will converge, will converge to the identity weak star. Hence it follows that uh, all amenable groups satisfy AP. Uh, but much more uh, groups satisfy AP. Uh, namely all three groups and about when it comes to SL uh, group special linear groups if we take n equals to 2 then SL to R SL to Z FAP but SL for higher n higher rank special linear groups uh, are examples without AP and about this last example the semi direct product uh, it is a group with with AP and this is a, uh, a special interesting example uh, because uh, it is an example of a group which has AP, but it's not weakly amenable. So uh, I did not formally introduce weak amenability, but it's an, it is a property in the middle between amenability and AP. And it turns out that it does not pass to, to extensions. However, one can show, or rather a group and cow show, that AP passes to extensions. Um, hence, because SL2Z and Z2 uh, are group with AP, the semi direct product also have AP. And it also shows that AP is really weaker property than weak amenability. Um, okay, and uh, I will, about this non examples, uh, I would like to mention that uh, Hagerup and Krauss, in their first paper on AP, uh, were unable to show that uh, if we take n at least three, then those groups. Do not satisfy approximation property, do not have approximation property. However, they suspect it. And uh, this result is of uh, Lavork and De La Salle, as far as I know. And it is quite it is quite difficult result. So uh, later on, I will, well, shortly, I will uh, introduce AP for quantum groups, and then I will discuss some approximation, uh, some permanence properties. Uh, and it turns out that AP satisfy, in particular in the in the classical context, satisfy lots of permanence properties. Hence, uh, it is rather difficult to find examples of groups without AP. Really, most of the groups that one uh, meets in life satisfy AP. 
the difficulty rather is to show that something does does not have AP. Sorry, uh, non examples are not necessarily closed with respect to extensions. I suppose. Uh, non examples. Well, uh, isn't it the case that if you have an extension, then both, or we, well, uh, AP passes to subgroups. Mm -hmm. But what, but if what not, about, so, sorry? But, but I'm talking about non-examples. Yes. Uh, so if you start with a group which doesn't have, if you start with both both groups which doesn't have AP, yeah. Say if you start with both groups which doesn't have AP and you take you consider extension, you have new group, and one of the groups that you started with sits as a subgroup. So if the big group has AP, then the subgroup also would have AP. Okay. Yeah. So in the sense, if you start with both group without AP, then the big group also won't have AP by the property that AP passes to closed subgroups. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because I was interested, uh, what about GLN? Oh yeah, so so here you have SL, SLN as a yeah, subject, right? It is not an example. Yes, not an yeah. example. Yeah, okay. I would think so. Yeah, same, mm -hmm. same by the by the subgroup property. Okay, now I would like to uh, go to uh, go to quantum situation, but maybe before that, let me stress that um, the net AI converges to the unit only weak star. Uh, hence, it is not the case that it is bounded in the CB norm. Typically, it is not. In fact, if it is bounded in the CB norm, uniformly bounded in the CB norm, then our group actually have weak amenability. So the interesting situations are when net is unbounded and it raises lots of well it raises some technical problems that one has to work with and this is the main reason why um, why we have to work with the force of operator space theory uh, because we have unbounded nets we cannot work with dense subspaces and uh, results coming from operator space theory allow us to well, do something in this uh, somewhat technical situation. Okay, let's go to let's go to quantum situation. So I would like to start. Sorry, uh, do you have an example of such a phenomenon? You have yeah. this uh, AI tending to the identity, but uh, this an unbounded net. Is there an easy example of such a situation? I don't think it will be that easy because you would have to have an well, you would have to have a group with AP without with amenability, something like the semi product. So I guess if you if you look at the papers, then you will find it. But out of top of my head, I cannot produce such example. Thank you. Okay, let's now to let's now go to quantum groups. Uh, my notion, the, the notion of quantum group that I will use is the notion of electron compact quantum group as introduced by Kusterman and Vaz. Um, so sl slightly informally, let's say that such um such an object, locally compact quantum group, comes together with uh, four objects m delta phi and psi. M is a von Neumann algebra. Delta called multiplication is a map from M to uh, von Neumann algebraic tensor product of M with itself. It is a normal star homomorphism. And phi and psi are uh, two weights, uh, which are uh, which are called uh, left and right higher integrals. And, um, and uh, well, multiplication, I won't use it, uh, so there's no need to spend too much time about it, but commodification, of course, satisfied the quasi-sensitivity condition, and higher integrals 
satisfy appropriate left and right invariance conditions. So this is the definition of Kustermans and Vaz of a quantum group in the language of von Neumann algebras. And as is typical, I will denote the von Neumann algebra M by L infinity of the blackboard G, despite the fact that M typically is non-commutative non -commutative algebra. So it doesn't correspond to our classical space. Uh, nonetheless, this uh, notation is quite uh, quite useful, as it suggests us how to think about object and hint of G. And then, well, it, it makes sense to denote pre-dual of M uh, by L1 of G. However, again, it doesn't correspond to a space of functions on uh, any classical space. Only, only L1 of G is the space of normal functions on L infinity of G. Okay, let's look at some examples, uh, which uh, hopefully will uh, justify the, the notation. So the first example, if G is classical locally compact group, uh, then we can con construct locally compact quantum group, which as a Vonema algebra has this space of bounded measurable classes of measurable bounded functions on, on G. Commultiplication delta is pullback of multiplication. And weights phi and psi are given by integration with respect to left and right R measures. With classical group, uh, we can also introduce another example. As a von Neumann algebra, this example has a group von Neumann algebra. Commultiplication uh, is a map which on generators, lambda of s, acts via this very simple formula. What is slightly non-trivial here is to, is to show that uh, such, such a map exists. And uh, theta is the Planchard weight, which on a dense subspace can be characterized via this very simple formula. However, again, uh, Sorry, I have some. May I? Yes. Yes. Uh, how do we distinguish uh, groups from sem semi-groups? in this framework. Because everything what is written here makes sense for semi-groups. This is a good question. I'm not sure if semi-groups will have hard measures, right? Uh, appropriate invariant, uh, normal semi-finite, faithful. Well, uh, measures with full support. Because L infinity of G corresponds to a uh, space of classes of <laughs> bounded functions on some space, uh, measurable space. We have, well, finite psi correspond to, to, to measures. Multiplication correspond to multiplication, In, indeed. It is the case that uh, I do not impose existence of um, of an inverse it, it, or co-inverse. It is something that is constructed. Uh, yeah, so I think the difference here is really that we impose existence of, of hard measures. Or in the non-commutative situation, appropriate weights. And then, uh, well, in the context of compact quantum groups of, of Professor Voronovich in the sister situation, there is this there are those cancellation properties. And in the in the situation of local compact quantum groups in the language of von Neumann algebras, one can construct the sister algebras and they also satisfy analogous properties. Yeah, so I think the 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 exist the assumption that we assume existence of hard integrals this this distinguish. But in this case, these functionals are not normalized, like, like in the compact case. Exactly. Those are weights, so, typically uh, infinite. Uh, could you remind me what is this NFS? What are the conditions for this? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, N is, stands for normal, S stands for semi-finite, and F stands for faithful. Faithful. So faithfulness is the... Uh, faithfulness... Uh, this way for existence of this of this way for for semi groups probably uh, yes I would think so mm -hmm. in, okay in the classical language it corresponds to the 
fact that our uh, support is is the whole space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but yes, it isn't something that is so easily seen to be equivalent. Yeah, but but it is strange because uh, because if you are basing everything on 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 this me measure or the hard measure, then maybe uh, maybe it would be enough to have some uh, some subset outside some measure zero subset of the group. Uh, Satisfying all these conditions, but maybe there is some measure zero set when which could distinguish this from from a group. It is it is not it is not obvious to me that that the condition for 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 uh, for this hard weight uh, excludes uh, excludes uh, all possible. Uh, semi group or, or even mono is different from group. Mm. Maybe well, but if you consider, yeah. well, I'm not sure if I understand if I understand the, the idea. But if you if you want to look at something which is in a sense group on a full measure set and not a group outside, can there be isn't it somehow? Okay, so let me rephrase. This uh, can there be a semi group which differs from a group uh, only on some uh, subset of, of measure zero or zero measure? If it's possible, then there is no way to distinguish this definition of, 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 uh, of a group from, 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 from a semi group. So maybe let's look at some very. I don't know. So so this is my doubt here. It's not it's not clear to me. If we look at very silly example, like let's take a semi group which is not a group, and let's consider as as a measure Dirac delta neutral element. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a strange choice of, of a measure. But... Yes, but uh, it will be. Well, I'm not sure if by looking, by discussing in this language of normal algebras, wouldn't we simply only see a part of the semi-group where everything is okay? <clears throat> but... <clears throat> so what would we assume about those measures? Uh, no, 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 it's, it's not this problem. If we assume all these conditions, I wonder if it's possible to, to have uh, an example, even if G is a classical space, measure space, okay? Uh, which, which, is a, which is a group uh, up to some uh, zero measure uh, subset. If this notion makes sense. I'm not sure if I understand correctly the precisely the problem. I'm not claiming anything. I, I would like to see clearly that that uh, these axioms uh, allows us to uh, recognize classical groups, not classical groups as uh, uh, semi groups uh, with with some properties. Yes, but I have a problem uh, with this uh, set of measure zero since it's somehow invisible from the point of view of L infinity. So so in other words, if you take some huge set, and then consider as, as Jacek proposed, um, a measure which is uh, Dirac delta in one particular point, then L infinity of this huge space is just a compact number. So, so 
your space is isomorphic to L infinity of the point. But as I said, you, you cannot recover it, as I said. But as a measure sp space modulo uh, sets of measure zero, it is isomorphic with just one point. Yes. Yes, from this language of phenomenal algebra, you don't see things which happen outside. With, with, with uh, an absorbing element, <clears throat> if you put if you put uh, delta measure on it, uh, then you would obtain a group uh, something uh, which is isomorphic to L infinity of a trivial group, as far as I understand it. Hmm. And in fact, it is so a so hard the, measure for so this. So the point. classical group. So my question is: Is the classical group uniquely determined by by this axiom, or or only up to some equivalence? I think that up to sets of measure zero. Okay. Well, so I would say that out of this axiom, if you assume that infinity of G is commutative, you obtain a unique classical group. It doesn't necessarily, mm -hmm. but I don't think it means that you cannot cannot obtain any semi group other, which would be uh, as a measure space equivalent. There is some comment. <clears throat> well, it's a paper we are discussing in, in math overflow, but maybe are you sure you want to do it now? So I, I just wanted to to put it in here because they mentioned the. Uh, condition on which uh, which is necessary for a hard measure to exist on the semi group. So I just wanted to put it here if someone is interested, because maybe it may help later to you know finish this discussion. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. So everybody the, has it in chat. So uh, not to go to this uh, to this uh, mass overflow. Uh, Question: uh, Is the answer uh, negative or positive? Uh, does it, this uh, car measure uh, notion um, does it does it make sense uh, for for locally compact semi groups? A locally finite Borel measure, locally co uh, sorry, it, it's connected to uh, the existence of minimal ideal. In short. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the depends on the finer study of ideals of the the group. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you very much. And also it is mentioned that it can fail even for finite examples in this discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not claiming that. <laughs> so you glance I know this into this example. But but sorry, uh, as as far as I understood your question, Thomas. So your question was slightly different. That you have something which is a, already a group, yes, and then you have a, a hard no, no, measure on the whole group, if, and and I somehow was if, if this uh, determines this group uh, uniquely. So in in the group case, um, uh, Jacek uh, said that uh, it is so. But I don't know what, what happens uh, for semi groups satisfying. Yes, but, but still you can. Okay, so so imagine the following situation: you start with a, a locally compact group, and you take a hard measure which is defined on this whole group, and then you uh, you extend this group to to some semi group, and then put this measure to be zero on this complement. But actually, it won't have full support, right? And this is something we would we would want out of a hard measure. Ah, having full support. Okay. So, so I'm not. I I uh, would like right. to see a uh -huh. clear statement of the problem. Mm. Uh, I see. I see. I see. Because okay. this. Yes. Yeah, so this is non-trivial. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think that <laughs> it's important yeah. here that we look at measures of full support and. Okay, maybe let's afterwards look at the 
uh, map stack, map stack discussion. And for now, I will continue. Okay, so neglecting uh, semi groups with any locally compact group, we can associate two quantum groups, locally compact quantum groups. And the first, uh, first example I want to consider as G, and the second example I want to consider as uh, I want to denote by G hat. And in fact, within framework of local compact quantum groups, uh, one can extend Pontryagin duality. And second example is in fact dual to uh, dual to G. So if, if G was abelian, then the second example can be identified with the Pontryagin dual. However, uh, it can be also considered in non-commutative situation. Uh, what are some important uh, properties of general quantum groups. Well, uh, with any locally compact quantum group G, we can associate uh, weak star dense star subalgebra C0 G. Uh, it is weak star dense in L infinity of G. Uh, in, uh, in those very easy examples, if G is classical, then this is simply the space of C0 function, continuous functions on G with vanish at infinity. And in the dual situation, the space is the reduced group system algebra of G. And as I mentioned, within the framework of local quant quant locally compact quantum groups, uh, we have duality, meaning that with any G we associate G hat. And if we do it twice, then we end up with the uh, quantum group that we've started with. Okay. Um, I want to. Well, I want to introduce AP. So we need to introduce uh, um, Fourier algebra and the space of bounded multipliers. So let's start with the Fourier algebra. For this, I want I want to rephrase the classical definition. So let's go back to the situation where G is a classical locally compact group. And as we've defined, for any vector xi and eta, uh, the matrix element function given by this formula uh, belongs to the Fourier algebra. Uh, one can identify the left regular representation with a single element in the tensor product of an infinity of G with the L of G. Uh, this element is denoted by W and, well, it corresponds simply to the measurable bounded function, which takes value in the group of an algebra. This is, so, um, So using this language, uh, function x goes to this inner product can be seen as a slice of operator w on the right leg by functional corresponding to vectors xi and eta. And now we are, this is language which is uh, language of slicing some operators is much better suited to, uh, to generalizing to the quantum situation. Uh, for certain mm -hmm. reasons, uh, it is more convenient to introduce here star. In the classical situation, it, uh, one can quite easily show that uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the space of functions the, that we've started with, as we defined A of G, is in fact equal to the slices, right, the space of right slices of W star. In other words, where algebra is invariant under adjoint, but in quantum situation, uh, there's a difference. And it is more convenient to, to look at slices of W star. Okay, uh, next, uh, using quantum terminology, quantum group terminology, the group of normal algebra of G is the space of infinity functions on G hat which is uh, something that we have in quantum situation. And furthermore, the Fourier, uh, we've said that the Fourier algebra um, is isomorphic to the pre of group of normal algebra, which using quantum terminology is L1 of G hat. Okay. So uh, to define Fourier algebra for locally compact quantum group, we need this operator W and we have it. It's Sometimes it is called Katz-Takasaki operator. 
and so how it works. So let D be a local, locally compact quantum group as defined by Kusterman and Vas. And we have left her integral uh, phi. And one can prove this actually a non trivial result uh, in the paper that there exists a unitary operator W, which is characterized uh, by, uh, by this equation. So W is an operator uh, which have, sits in the tensor product. And if we take slice of the left leg, then we obtain operate some operator. And when it acts on lambda phi of x, then uh, it acts via the following formula. This is actually the way to, this is actually how it is defined. But one has to check a lot of things. And maybe one thing to mention is that the right-hand side makes sense uh, by left invariance of phi. So W is a unitary operator. Left leg belongs to L infinity of G. Right leg, right leg belongs to L infinity of G hat. And this equation characterizes our operator. However, what is really important for us that uh, it is an analog of the left regular representation in quantum situation. Now, by direct analogy to the classical situation, after the slight rephrasing, uh, let's let's define let's consider uh, map lambda hat, which is the map which takes functional on an infinity of G hat, and slices W star. And uh, consequently, we define the Fourier algebra uh, of G as the image of this map. And uh, so in this way, we obtain a space of operators in L infinity of G. One can show that in fact, the space is invariant under multiplication. Uh, next, if we define a norm on the space uh, by the norm of the corresponding functional. In fact, it, is a, it, it gives the same formula as in the classical situation. And one shows that this space <clears> of <throat> functions, in fact, since sits in C0G. Okay, so as a banner, we obtain an isomorphic isomorphism of the Fourier algebra with L1 of G hat. Basically, by definition, we have bijection, by definition of the Fourier algebra, by the way we define norm this this isomorphism is isometric. And uh, one checks, it, it boils down to property of, of W, uh, the, uh, the pentagonal equation, to be more precise. And that this is isomorphism of algebras. Hence, we can, as in the classical situation, we can identify Fourier algebra with L1 of G hat, the pre dual of L infinity of G hat. In the classical situation, we end up precisely with the with the same space of, of functions. So this is our definition of the Fourier algebra. It, it is a subspace in L infinity of G. It is a Banach algebra with some uh, larger norm. And uh, by definition, it consists of operators lambda hat of omega, which are slices of W star. So we have Fourier algebra. The next thing to look at are CB multipliers. So directly, very much as in this classical situation, we say that function L infinity function is a left CB multiplier of the Fourier algebra if the Fourier algebra is invariant under multiplication by it. And the corresponding map, uh, which we uh, can see as a map on L1 of G hat, is completely bounded. Very much as in the classical situation. Uh, next, theta L of A is CB map, normal CB map on L infinity of G hat, and we define norm of A by the CB norm of this operator. The space of uh, CB multipliers is denoted by this expression. The only difference between this situation and the classical one is that now we need to distinguish that those are left multipliers, which corresponds to the fact that we multiply lambda hat of omega uh, from left. 
if we multiply it by right uh, on the right by a, we would obtain right multipliers. But we make this choice to work with left multipliers. Okay, I need to erase it. Um, okay, as before. So now we have and now we have space of left CV multipliers. The next step is to is to look at its pre-dual. Definition is very much the same. We embed L1 into the dual space. With the closure, we obtain uh, some space, and uh, one can check and that it is a pre-dual space to the space of left spin multipliers. And in fact, it is real due to Shu, Ruan, and Neufang in the quantum situation. Next, uh, one defines AP, approximation property of a local compact quantum group, uh, by, uh, by saying that there exists a net AI in the Fourier algebra such that uh, AI converges to one weak star in the space of left three multipliers. So the definition and construction after the slight uh, reformulation <clears throat> is as in the approximation property of a group and cross. Uh, all right. So now uh, let me uh, let me mention Sorry, our first. I have uh, a question. Yes. Uh, you could have left multipliers, right multipliers, two-sided multipliers. Uh, why, why, why only left? Why, why, why you consider only left version? Uh, well, when it comes to left and right multipliers. Uh, it's a matter of choice. Uh, yes. What do I mean? Uh, here we define AP by existence of net in the free algebra such that we have convergence, we have convergence in the space of left multipliers, but uh, what can show that this property is equivalent to the uh, assuming existence where we have convergence as right multipliers. Okay, so you can switch uh, style, but uh, if you, assume that these multipliers are two-sided. Is there a difference or not? This, I would say, is a very good question. And uh, we we've st we studied it in the... Uh, we've studied it in the uh, discrete situation. And as unless I'm confusing something, it, it corresponds to the notion of central AP. Of what could it be? Uh, central approximation property. Central approximation property. One introduces central notions. Well, in, mm -hmm. so in the classical, uh, in the discrete situation, those elements are really uh, sequences of of matrices, right? Uh, because an infinity of G for discrete quantum group G is a direct sum of matrix spaces. And then uh, uh, one introduces central AP if our net of elements in the Fourier algebra, in fact, consists of sequences which at each uh, at each um, entry have only scalar time times the unit. This corresponds to, uh, and this is a central approximation property. And as far as, far as I know, well, I'm sure it gives a different. So this, it, this was in the, in the discrete case. Yes, this is in the discrete situation. Uh, we haven't studied in it in the locally compact setting, so I'm not. That f but so uh, similarly to central AP for discrete quantum groups, one introduces central weak amenability, central amenability, and uh, for amenability, it is known that in fact this property is different. As far as I know. It is not known if this property is genuinely different for weak amenability and AP. For all examples that we have, uh, that people construct uh, for weak amenability, AP, indeed, one obtains, one can obtain uh, central versions. And yes. in classical situation, it, it really doesn't matter, right? Because uh, spaces are abelian. Yeah, so, 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 so this uh, central 
properties is, is one solution to this problem. But but two-sided multipliers uh, would be a more general situation, I suppose. Only in only in this discrete case, maybe it's the same, but but in general. Oh, oh you mean you mean in general? It's more general. Yeah, we haven't studied. Yeah, I guess it it makes sense to look at those, but we haven't studied. Mm -hmm. So this would be assuming that AI C well multiplies from both left and right. We haven't studied, so I'm I'm not sure if this gives something different. Thank you. I'm sorry, related to that, uh, since I'm a little bit confused, uh, you said that it doesn't matter whether we take uh, left or right multiplier, but uh, we also used left regular representation in our construction. Am I right? Uh, yes. So maybe, uh, uh, okay, so again, if we instead uh, taking left regular representation, take the right one, it also doesn't matter, but uh, is this choice of left or right multiplier somehow uh, should be uh, consistent with this choice of left or right it, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be to pass from one to the other one uses unitary antipodes and it works uh, it's not like uh, we look at the same net but with net giving left version of ap we can using unitary antipode we can construct net giving right version of ap okay so you have in fact, you have two choices, one for the choice of this regular representation and the other choice for the side of our multipliers and both these choices are independent, yes, from each other? Yes, yeah, okay. I would say okay. so, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Using the fact, well, using the conco cycle deriva derivative between left and right are integrals, uh, one typically one can tra translate between this choice of left hard integral and right hard integral. Sometimes it, some modular theory gets involved, but I, I think the mm -hmm. well, I don't know of any situation where this choice would be something really important. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, groups which are not unimodular. Uh, so these exact formulas are different, but uh, still this uh, quality. Tatif, yes, uh, the properties are the same, yes. It, it was more convenient for us to work with uh, both cho cho choices being left. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. But for example, Shu, Neufeng, and Ruan work in the right setting for AP. Uh, okay, so uh, the pre dual space. Uh, QL is defined in a very abstract way. Uh, we embed L1 in the dual space and we take closure. So every L1 function uh, belongs to QL, but there are more functions and it is, I would say, not at all clear what kind of functions are there. And the uh, first, let me now mention uh, our theorem, uh, which basically characterizes uh, this convergence. Um, so, uh, by definition, G has AP if and only if there exists a net AI which converges with star to the unit. And it is by, uh, well, one can characterize all the elements in the, in the pre dual space. And in this way, we obtain a more direct, uh, more direct statement. What does it mean to converge to the unit in the weak star topology? And it is this, precisely this, this condition, that there exists a net in the Fourier algebra, uh, such that, uh, well, uh, with element in the Fourier algebra, uh, we obtain a CB, normal CB map on L infinity of G hat. Hence, yeah, yeah, take... can you remind me what this underlined in green symbol means, theta L? Uh, theta L uh, is the, Sorry. Uh, well, uh, with the element of the Fourier algebra. Oh, yes. Aha, it's here. Uh, so any element in the Fourier algebra is a left CB multiplier. Uh, 
So it gives a map which acts on the Fourier algebra level. If we take dual, uh, if we take dual mapping, we obtain QL, which acts between anything of the head with, to itself. In the classical situation, it was really the map between group of minimal algebra to itself. Mm -hmm. And L stands for what? L stands for our choice that we choose to uh, multiply uh, by A on the left. Ah, so it's L like left. Okay. It's yes. not the number. Okay. No, no, it's okay. it corresponds to left because we could choose choose right version and we <clears throat> want to um, okay, thank you very keep much. this choice in the notation. So theta L of AI is a normal CV map on L infinity of G hat. In <laughs> particular, it can act on C0 of G hat. And because we are in the nice situation, our map is completely bounded normal, we can consider it tensoring with identity on a compacts. Then we can take omega, which is uh, which is in this uh, tensor product, which is the space of normal functionals on L infinity of the hat and B of L2, and we can take pairing. So, and we uh, and precisely convergence weak star amounts to convergence of this net of numbers. I have a question. Yes. Could we replace uh, compact operators on L2 by some system of, of, of matrix algebras here? Uh, what kind of system? It would depend on... Uh, I would think taking, depends. taking all finite dimensional matrices. Uh, and uh, and assuming that for each size of matrix this will hold, then I don't think it is equivalent. No, I think it would be too weak. It will be too weak. So is it stronger? Okay. Yes, because I think if you if you have this convergence for each matrix size separately, then mm -hmm. this introducing this matrices doesn't introduce anything new. Okay. Because then you write this as sum of n squared. Mm -hmm and squared numbers, and you would end up simply with uh, point weak star convergence. And this tensoring with compacts really gives something stronger. It is called stable point weak star convergence. Yes. But I, I would think that if you somehow glue together to obtain matrices arbitrarily large in single step, then it would be okay. But, uh, but for sure not for large, but fixed finite size of matrices. Yes, yes, yes. I am talking about all possible. Yes, yes, but at, for each x, single n. Yeah, so I think we cannot assume here to take for each n, for each x. This yes, yes, yeah. so, I understand this. I understand this. So this is like uh, uh, requiring that you have uh, pointwise convergence, but only on the dense set. And whether you can infer from this pointwise convergence on a dense set the pointwise convergence of the on the whole set, and indeed it can be done in some cases. But for example, if you require something like that, uh, the this family is uh, uniformly bounded in norm. But here and we this is precisely what nets. we don't have. Yes. yes, exactly. We have just general net, not ordinary sequence, so we cannot infer mm -hmm. that. So this, this is an analog of uniformity in what you are saying. Well, it gives some replacement for that, oh. but it doesn't Im imply that this. Oh, oh yeah, uh, maybe. But uh, what we can prove somehow in upgrade uh, this convergence is that equivalently we can assume that uh, we have stronger convergence. Uh, namely, we can take X in the Von Neumann algebraic tensor product of anything of the head with bounded operators. It, and this is something uh, I would say, well, I don't have examples that it is really stronger, but it's, I don't, I'm not claiming that if we take any net from the second point that it will converge in the, uh, in the, in the third point. Rather, what I'm claiming that is that we can correct net from the second point so that uh, we obtain a stronger way of converging uh, in the stable point which start topology. 
this is quite te technical result. However, uh, it was uh, is important, I would say, uh, because well, it was important in various uh, reasons that we that we do, but also uh, Jason Cran used approximation property of quantum groups where we where he uh, used the stronger notions of convergence. So he used he worked with AP defined in a different way, a priori different way, where he assumed existence of net in the full algebra, such that this convergence from the third bullet point holds. And we showed that actually those two notions are equivalent. But it is not a trivial thing in particular. Uh, it could, uh, one possibly have to look at another net. Practice. Could you explain what is this stable point W star topology? Uh, okay, so if we look first, well, this is just a name for what is written later, but if we looked at point weak star topology, mm -hmm. it would mean that we apply our normal CB map to X in anything of G hat. Okay. So forget about matrices, then you obtain point weak star topology and name of stable corresponds to taking matrices and tensoring matrices or compact operators uh, in the context of point weak star topology really we look at here at b of l2 whole b of l2 so in mm -hmm. the third bullet point we work in the von algebraic setting we take b of l2 and normal functionals Um, uh, I have time till uh, 7 p.m., right? Uh, well, 18.45, but... Okay. 18.47, sorry. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so this is first result I wanted to mention, and it gives uh, equivalence between our way of, say, our way of defining AP and uh, AP of json Cram. Uh, the next thing I would like to mention uh, is how this how this property relates to other widely more widely studied approximation properties. Well, directly from the definition of weak amenability that I didn't introduce, one sees that weak amenability implies AP. However, what is what is surprising I would say is that it is not clear if amenability of G implies AP. I will comment on that shortly, but in fact, what is true uh, and was proved by Jason Cran is that if a locally compact quantum group is amenable and has AP, then jihad is co-amenable. So let me remind you that there is this famous open question in the theory of locally compact quantum groups, if amenability of G implies co-amenability of jihad. This is open and Jason Cran showed that if Additionally, one throws in AP for G, then this implication holds. So uh, this this shows that this terminology is maybe not the best, but uh, to be precise, amenability of G really is defined as an existence of mean, and the and not the way, not the gen it is not a generalization of the notion of amenability that I introduced using the result of Leptin. The direct generalization of the property described by Leptin's theorem would rather be strong amenability or amenability of the dual. Uh, hence, uh, we do not know if amenability of G implies AP, despite that it is, it is very much expected. And actually, if this holds, then it solves a uh, very, very interesting open problem in theory of quantum groups. Sorry, is this if a typo? Uh, which if? If. Uh, oh, yes. Sorry, it's it should be in fact. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I will correct it. Uh, okay, so weak amenability implies AP. And which problem in quantum groups did you have in mind? 
uh, if amenability of G implies co-amenability of G hat. Okay. Okay. As far as I know, this is something open. Uh, and the other way around implication? Yes. The other implication, co-amenability of G hat implies amenability of G. Mm. It is known and it is rather, uh, it is not too difficult. All right. OK, let me now mention um, uh, some of our results, namely permanence properties uh, that we were studied with Matt and Christian. Uh, first, uh, we so show- I have a question. Yes? I'm still thinking about the pre previous uh, page. Uh, is this AP symmetric, in a sense? If, if, if G hat is uh, co-amenable, co and it has an AP property. Does it mean that G is amenable? Yes, of course, because uh, you don't have to assume AP on the other side. It is enough yeah. to assume that G hat is amenable to- This AP is symmetric with respect to dualization of this group. What do you mean? So assume that, that uh, G hat is co-amenable, co okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it has AP property. Does yes. it mean that G is amenable? That is a true statement, yes. Okay, thank you. Though you do not have to assume that G hat has AP. Okay. In fact, if, if G hat is co amenable, then G is amenable and has AP. So AP is irrelevant in this direction. In the in the other direction, yes, it is irrelevant. Okay. And you can find examples of caminable quantum groups which do not have AP, namely classical groups without AP. All classical groups are caminable. Okay. So I would say that. AP should be thought of as a very weak form of amenability despite this open question. Okay, uh, about permanence properties, uh, some of our results. Well, uh, the first thing to mention is that for discrete quantum groups, one can introduce notion of a free product, which is a generalization of free product of discrete groups and uh, free product passes to uh, sorry, and AP passes to the free product. Next, uh, if H is a closed quantum subgroup of G and the large group G has AP, then the smaller group H also have, has AP. And here I mean closed quantum subgroup in the sense of bus. Um, probably another uh, result uh, is that, um, well, uh, with locally compact quantum group G, one can introduce, one can associate Dreamfeld double G, D of G, and we show that the dual of the Dreamfeld double has AP if and only if both G and G hat have AP, and also uh, AP passes to products. Sorry, so I cannot resist, resist to, to comment this third condition. So, so in fact, AP is the metric in this pair. So, Okay. It, on, the, on, the, on the level of, of, of uh, the dual of the Dreamfeld double. So it's a way to make to, to make this this uh, approximation property symmetric, but on the level of the Dreamfeld double, dual of the Dreamfeld double. In the sense that you and then it's symmetric with respect to G and G hat. Yes. Then yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay, and using those properties, uh, we can give some examples of quantum groups without AP. Namely, we can look at products or duals to the Dreamfeld double. Uh, and, and start with something which, which we know to not have AP, and then we construct something more complicated quantum, which still doesn't have AP. Uh, though, I guess it can be seen as um, not entirely satisfactory, Satisfactory because 
we start with something that doesn't have a key. Okay, and in the remaining time, uh, five minutes, say I, uh, I will, um, I want to comment uh, on the third bullet point, namely to, in some more details, uh, describe the situation on the dual of the Dreamfeld double. Uh, because I would think this gives a way of constructing very non-trivial examples uh, where we know uh, if the if the resulting quantum group have AP or, or doesn't have. Uh, okay, so let's start with what is a Dreamfeld double. And I would like to mention here that as far as I know, there are two competing conventions and the terminology that I'm using is from a paper of us. Uh, and though some people, the quantum group that I call Dreamfeld double would call the dual of Dreamfeld double. Uh, but I'm following paper of us because he works in the local quantum setting and fundamental algebraic language. And it was most convenient for us to follow his notation. So what is the Dreamfeld double? Um, first, well, I won't give you the full definition. It is it is quite complicated. Uh, so, sorry, full construction, uh, as it is as it is rather technical and complicated. Um, however, um, the algebra of L infinity functions on Dreamfeld double is simply tensor product of L infinity of G with L infinity of G hat. So something very simple. Uh, the twist comes into commultiplication. So um, uh, say we have X element in the algebra of functions on the Dreamfeld double, and we apply we want to apply commultiplication to this element X. So what do we do? We first apply com commultiplication of G to the left leg, commultiplication, commultiplication of G hat to the right leg, and, and then in the middle we apply Philip. Then we uh, we land in the appropriate space. But if we do only that, if we forget about this M, then we would obtain simply a product of G and G hat. Uh, so the twist say, comes into, uh, by introducing M, and M is called matching. It is a map, uh, it is a st star automorphism of M G cross G hat given by this, this inner automorphism using Kastek as a operator. So I would think it is a way of, a way to think about it, it is that it is an interaction between G and G hat. And it makes this construction uh, non-trivial. Uh, Jacek, and when you are finite dimensional and all this analysis is irrelevant, uh, then do you recover the usual Hopf algebraic concept for the Dreamfold double? I would think so, or maybe the dual because of the different yeah, yeah, yeah. conventions. Right. Yeah, then I would think so, yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm I'm afraid that I'm lost with these numbers of legs in this tensor product. So yes. after all, it should land uh, where? It has four legs. It should and, have four legs. And a middle two, you twist. Ah, okay, so, so sigma and M goes from, okay. Sigma and M works on the leg Number two and three. Two yeah. and three. Okay. So two legs. Okay. Okay. It's fine. Um, yeah. So communication should land in the space of two legs, but they are doubled. Um, okay. So uh, Bonham algebra and infinity of the Dreamfeld double is rather simple. The twist comes into commultiplication. And on the dual side, uh, the von Neumann algebra is the is the twisted thing. So it is generated by L infinity of G hat on the left leg, L infinity of G on the second leg, but it is twisted uh, by certain unitary operator. It, it isn't terribly important what this operator is, uh, but we have precise formula for it. Um, what will be important for us is that we have uh, we have two maps theta one, theta two, which allows us to embed L infinity of G hat and L infinity of G in a say canonical way into L infinity of the dual to the Dreamfeld double. 
Okay, so to, now let me give you a sketch of how how we prove that dual to the Dreamfield double have AP. If we assume that G and G have AP. Uh, so by assumption, we have net in the full algebra of G, net in the full algebra of G hat, uh, which converge to unit weak star. Uh, one can show that if we restrict the maps theta one and theta two to the Fourier algebra, then we land in the space of CB multipliers. Not necessarily in the Fourier algebra, but in the space of CB multipliers. And furthermore, the weak star converges reserves. AI converge to, to one in the space of CB multipliers on Fourier algebra of G. And if we apply theta one, we have analogous weak star converges the dual to the Dreamfield double. But, uh, Though this is this is something quite non non trivial. Those are things to be checked. Next, if we multiply elements of those two nets, we obtain something in the Fourier algebra. And because space of CV multipliers is a dual Banach algebra, we obtain a con again convergence to one. And this shows AP of the dual dual to the triple double. Um, so the strategy is rather very straightforward. We take the nets that we have, but the devil is in the details to check those those properties. Uh, but in the end, um, using the, the expected nets, we obtain AP of the dual to the Ringfield double. And the way to go back is really uh, using the fact that both G and G hat see it as a uh, see it as a closed subgroups in the dual to the Dreamfield double. So it's AP of those follow from a more general result about that AP passes to uh, closed quantum subgroups. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe I would like now to end with the last result uh, that relates AP of a locally compact quantum group to approximation property of Fudem algebra. Maybe if G has AP and is arbitrary locally compact quantum group, then element of G hat has a operator space version of approximation properties, property, certain approximation property that is suitable for dual operator spaces. And we can go back if we assume that our quantum group is discrete and unimodular. Then from which star operator approximation property of element of G hat, we can deduce uh, AP of G. Uh, and the time is up, so I would like to end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacek. Okay, we already had a number of questions, but let's continue. Adam, you seem to be eager. Uh, no, no, I'm just uh, clapping. clapping hands. Okay, <laughs> yes. So I can do the same. Uh, anybody in room 405? No, everybody is satisfied. Richard Ludwig. I'm satisfied. Wow, that's cool. OK, so it seems that all the questions were asked already during your talk. Um, let me ask you a sort of a tangential question. Um, because it is not related to approximation properties, but it is related to this um, uh, definition um, of a Greenfield double. Uh, you, you see, for uh, the algebraic Greenfield doubles for finite dimensional Hopf algebras, uh, in order to handle Hopf cyclic homology, we introduced what we called anti yeta Greenfield doubles. And then these are if you want Galois objects of a Greenfield doubles. So, uh, you could say that you have a locally compact quantum group that acts freely and ergodically, uh, you know, on 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 your sister algebra. So I was wondering if what we could get this kind of anti for double in this sister algebraic language uh, uh, in pure analogy with what we have for finite dimensional Hopf algebras. That's just what came to my mind while you were speaking about it. Okay. So, so, of course, you know that every group acts on itself freely and the quotient is a point. So, uh, you, you can, in, in, in the non-cognitive world, uh, the concept of 
of spaces which are, if you want, uh, just trivial bundles over a point is not necessarily so trivial. You have, for instance, the, the non commutative torus is a Galois object of a classical torus, okay? And that's very far away from the classical torus. Uh, classical torus acts freely and um, transitively on the quantum uh, torus, and uh, this is a prototypical example. And, and this is a very, very useful um, object because just as uh, yet Greenfield modules uh, can be viewed as algebras uh, of a Greenfield doubles, um, and at Greenfield modules, where coefficients for Hopf cyclic homology can be viewed as modules over anti Greenfield doubles. And I, but but we always did it purely algebraically. And I was wondering if if um, your you know quant sister analytic definition of a Greenfield double would extend itself to to this sort of uh, uh, affine space. You know, is that like like vector space and affine space? So you, you should think about this anti-eta Greenfield as an affine space over the vector space of a Greenfield double. I'm afraid we worked mainly in bottom algebraic setting and we worked in a more general situation of double products. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was really a bottom algebraic definition uh, where you have G and G hat and more general matching than just. If, if you would go back, yeah, like if you'd go back to this definition of this twist and, and so on, sigma and M. Oh, you see uh, here. So here, what you have, you have honest coproduct. Uh, but basically what happened is that you twist it in a slightly different way, okay? And this is not a coproduct, but it is a coaction. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, it, it works beautifully. It's it's uh, it's a very important uh, twist, okay? And um, I was wondering if one could implement it at this level, because again, it should be given by some sort of M, but of course, not like this. And it, it's very tempting for me uh, to consider uh, entering info double exactly in terms of such an M. Richard, what do you think? Because you also did some work with Christian Focht in this direction. I'm not quite sure. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, so... it's, you cannot do it ad hoc. I mean, you have to think. First, you have to reboot myself. Yeah, no, no, I don't know. Yeah. Automatically, okay. I don't know. Okay. Okay. But it's something worth thinking about, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. So if nobody has any further questions, let's thank Jacek again. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Let me stop recording, but please don't go away. <laughs>